Yeah, I won't. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm going to read some notes from you. But what I'm going to do is tell you about what happens in the cull area. Because when you live every day, every night, uh, every moment with it happening around you, it is quite a difficult situation to say the very least. Um, but first of all, let me just tell you a bit about the cull area itself. West Somerset Cull area is similar to Gloucestershire, and I know Pete will talk about Gloucestershire later on. But what you realise, not realise first of all, bear in mind we're in Hampshire, is that the Cull area is as big as the Isle of Wight. It's not a tiny little pocket or a corner stuck away somewhere out of the way. It's a significant area. And in that area, 70% of the landowners decided they were going to support the coal. Some willingly, some not sure, some bullied into taking part, I can assure you. And we've come across all of those situations. But the thing is, that you have to remember, this is supposed to be a, a campaign or, or a coal, and Chris made the point earlier about the fact it's going to be so, so-called so um, funded and completed by the farmers and by the NFU. And clearly, uh, that's not really the case. We've paid for it significantly. And I'm sure Dominic will talk about the costs later. But certainly, we're talking about a, a, cow, or a, a coal that really started off on the wrong footing. There's no way it was going to work from day one. Everybody told the government that. Everybody told the NFU that. Everybody told DEFRA that. But they did not listen. And Chris made the point about ignorance. And ignorance is really one of the biggest problems we have as humans, I think. But the cull area doesn't have a lot of cows, surprisingly enough. Um, there are probably about 40 to 60% of the holdings included in the coal that have cows. The vast majority don't have cows. What we do have is large game shoots. Shargot Estate, Coombe Sydenham, Exmoor Sporting, large acreages of land that probably, and I say probably, and I have to say that because of legal reasons, uh, managed badgers before. What the coal did was give them an excuse to manage it even more if they really wanted to. But certainly there's large estates there that are inclined towards shooting. And next more, virtually every other house has a gun in the cupboard. They live by the gun. They have a problem. They don't come to that training and get a license to deal with it or they don't think about it in, in a conservation base. They kill it. And then that's replaced by another animal called another problem and they kill that one. And that's the attitude. That's the mentality we're dealing with. We're dealing with a society that thinks gun first and conservation second, unfortunately. And what I would say is that this is not the case in all situations. Within the Somerset Cull area, our group initiative to vaccinate badgers have vaccinated 236 badgers in the last two and a half years on land in the cull area or effectively within the area which is covered by the coal. So there are people, and Chris made the point that not all farmers are that way and certainly that is the case, but there are people in amongst all the shooting that's going on that are standing up and saying no, we don't want you to shoot our badgers, we want to do something more sustainable, we want to try vaccination and luckily we've been able to work with them and do that at a very minimal cost. So what actually happened in the, in the cull area? Well, really, we started off on day one with a so-called free shooting trial. This was to shoot badgers with, with, with shotguns or rifles, particularly. Um, that was going to be a cheap option. That everybody or anybody that had a gun who had half a brain could actually take part in. What happened from day two on the first year of the, of the, of the cull was cage traps were put out. Significant numbers of cage traps. So it was never, ever a free shooting trial. From day one, it was a badger massacre trial. Let's kill as many as we can by whatever means we can. And the thing to bear in mind is that on the, in the situation with the coal, what it did, it actually gave a blueprint for anybody else who wanted to kill a badger to take part in some illegal badger killing. We run a 24-7 helpline in our badger group. In the first three weeks of the coal this year, not last year, this year, we had a 250% increase in reported incidents of badger persecution. And that was badgers that were being snared, badgers that were being shot, sets that were being filled with slurry and human waste, sets of bonfires on top of them, badgers being chased with quad bikes. So it wasn't really a question of a, a legalised badger coal. It was a legalised badger coal that allowed people to act illegally across the county, not just in the cull area, but across the county. What did it do to the communities? It split the communities. It split families. It split people who've been lifelong friends because it was such a strong emotive problem. A problem that the desperation within the farming community took on board because it was desperation that took it on board. 
in gen generally the case. They had little other option. They've had years and years. They've had government after government letting them down in terms of trying to find a so solution to bovine TB. And bovine TB on a farm can bring it to its knees. Chris made the point about whilst he was speaking, the dairy farm had gone bust. Since I've been speaking, probably the other one has. Um, and it's all to do with the way that they're actually governed by the rules and regulations that come from DEFRA, that come from government, that come from the power of the supermarket. All these things have a significant effect and farms go out of business. I made the point earlier about it being a living hell. It is a living hell. When you know that next to your home, in badger sets that you've watched for decades, you've seen the badgers reproduce, you've seen the cubs in that year, you know they're being shot. And you can hear the guns being fired. It's not very nice. Well, I'll be careful what I say because there are some policemen here now. And uh, we welcome you. Quite no, sincerely, we welcome you. But we do have a problem, I believe, in the first year of the call with policing. I certainly feel from my experience with the police, and I dealt with them on a number of occasions. I met the chief constable, I met the PCC, I met the silver commander who ran the coal um, operation. And in my opinion, they were under a lot of pressure from the Home Office particularly, and from the infamous Mr. Patterson, um, to do what they needed to do to make sure the coal went along according to the plans of the NFU and DEFRA put in place. Well, I can assure you that is true. I can give you lots of experiences, and I'm sure Pete can as well from Gloucestershire, lots of experiences where we were basically victimised and we were basically guilty before proven innocent by the police. We were stopped unnecessarily, we were searched, we were held up, we were blocked in, people were arrested unnecessarily and incorrectly um, and like all the time that was happening it was a problem and it wasn't until after the first year of the call we found out why that was happening and we found out the NFU actually had a control room within the police control room um, we made representations when that was made known to us and luckily it didn't happen this year but what it did do it gave the police and the NFU a direct contact with their operatives in the field who had radio systems that went straight through to the control room and just give you a very quick example of an experience we had where one of our members was being assaulted by two shooters who claimed they'd pinched his badger. And actually, the fact, we'd moved it half an hour before. Um, and it went in. It was one of the ones that you see on the picture. One of the badgers that was actually found to be illegally, sorry, found to be inhumanely shit shot. NFU denied it was theirs originally, but they wanted it back subsequently. But that guy was being assaulted by two shooters chasing this badger they shot that had got away. And when he reported to the police, by the time he got his message through to the police control room, the shooters had contacted their contact in the control room, and he was being accused of assaulting them. So you can see how difficult it was in the first year. The second year this year, it was better. We had a, a better liaison with the police, but unfortunately, the mistrust that was generated in the first year carried over to this year. And there are a lot of people who still feel it's difficult for us to work with the police. Personally, I don't think that's the case. I still work with them. I think it's important we do. But there are people who find it hard. What do the patrols do? Well, they basically put themselves in a position where there was a presence where we knew shooting was going on. We operated slightly differently to Gloucestershire, and I'm sure say, Pete May will talk about it later, but we operated on intelligence-led information because we didn't have the resources to cover the whole area. So we responded dynamically to information coming into us. So on some days, we wouldn't actually organise our patrols until the very last minute. It meant we had a more, a greater impact. But what it did do, it meant that the responsible shooters, when they saw us, a bit like the Indians on the horizon coming over with the yellow jackets on, um, they put their guns away. I was asked by the BBC what effect that had. And I said, well, the responsible shooters will put their guns away, and it means that that night some badgers will be saved. And he said, well, the irresponsible shooters. I said, they shouldn't have guns in the first place. <laughs> So what's the best outcome we've got from where we are in terms of the call? I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to read to you in a moment a report from the independent expert panel from last year recalling the death of one badger. It won't be very nice. When I last told people this in Colchester, people were crying, so I'll apologise in advance if that causes you to cry. But it's the reality of what actually happened. But the good thing about it is, is that we had, and I'm sure Pete will echo this, we had people from all walks of life from across the whole country, coming to the cull areas, putting themselves out in the middle of the night in pouring rain. And some people came out every single night of the cull. They came out in the pouring rain and they worked together with various other groups and organisations and made a difference. And I don't know if anybody's here from the HSA. They get a bad press, unfortunately, too often, in my opinion. But as far as the HSA goes, I salute you. Yeah, me too. 
they do an excellent job. Bear with me, this is the badger that was shot as never several times. This is part of the independent expert panel. I know it's in 2013 this happened. We don't know what happened in 2014 because Mr. Patterson not only moved the goalpost, he took the referee away as well. So we ended up with a call taking place with nobody monitoring it independently. So the chances are that what happened in 2013 probably was repeated in 2014, despite the fact the NFU tell us they train people uh, great, in a, to a greater level than they did in the first year. We don't think that's the case. We certainly picked a badger up that was shot inhumanely, and that badger went for private post-mortem. It cost us £1,000, but it's £1,000 well spent if it means we get evidence to show that they're still shooting badgers humanely. In the first year, something like 20% of the badgers shot were shot inhumanely. This is one of them. This is a situation where there's a shooter, a spotter, and an independent monitor on one side of a the stream. They're 30 metres away from a badger. The badger shot from 30 metres away. The badger sits up and tries to get away, but his back end is hanging down so it can't get away. 30 seconds later, it's shot again from 30 metres away. The badger's still there, lifting its head, trying to get away. To get to the badger across the stream, they've got to walk 300 metres downstream and go over a bridge and back up the other side to get to the badger they just shot twice. So the, the spotter and the monitor start to walk down towards the bridge. The shooter is still on the other side of the stream at the moment. At 511 seconds after the first shot, shot four, this takes place. So the badger's now been shot four times from 30 meters. These are excellent, trained marksmen, high-powered rifles, state-of-the-art technology, night sights, and everything else. But it's been shot four times from 30 meters. The badger's still alive. and still trying to lift its head and get away. 539 seconds have passed by. The other people are still walking towards the badger. The shooter is still on the other side of the stream. In 539 seconds, shot five takes place. This badger has now been shot five times from 30 metres. And they're still alive. They're still trying to get away. Up until... 600 seconds this badger is still alive. Up until 700 seconds this badger is still alive. By this time the shooter started to walk down the river, down the stream, to get to the other side. It's 614 seconds. 10 minutes. The badger shot from close range by the shooter. At 870 seconds, 14 and a half minutes after the first shot, the badger is pronounced dead. That's the reality of what happens in some of the cases. We believe it could be 20%, so we're told from the independent expert panel. I can assure you it happens all the time, not just within the coal, but outside the coal. And one of the things that we're trying to get people to do, and we're going to be working with Gloucestershire on this and also Birders Against Wildlife Crime, we are trying to get all you merry people who enjoy walking in the countryside who enjoy seeing the things that happen in the countryside in terms of the nice things, but to start looking and reporting the things that are not so nice. Record badger sets. Let us know what you find. Record suspicious activity. We're in a situation where our police forces are not performance measured for dealing with wildlife crime. It's a reportable offence, but there's no performance measure against this, the prosecution or the solution or, or the investigation into that crime. We need to get the Home Office to think twice. We need to get them to make wildlife crime a performance-related activity within the police. Then we might get some resources put behind it.
But all I say to you is whatever you possibly can do, Chris talked about social media, write to your MPs, taking parts in these sorts of activities as well again in Birmingham in the new year. Get up there, get out there, find out, make your voice known, talk to people, write to people, twi pe twi Twitter people, <laughs> Facebook people, whatever you do, or not into social media, but make sure we don't let this, this problem go away. Because the one thing the government appeared to be trying to do now is try to make it less of a, an issue than it was. And I suspect that's something to do with what might happen next May. But thank you all so, so very much for all those who came out. As people here, I can see faces in the crowd that I recognise that came out night after night after night in all winds and weathers. You came out, you put yourself in the front line, and you made the difference. And we can make the difference. Let's do it. Yay!